Hi, and welcome back to the channel. I've got a book review today, and a book review of a book called The Trials of Ice Mount by John Palladino. This bad boy here. Chunkiness, very pretty. Moses should start off by saying that I sort of know John, insofar as I've done a lot of streams with John over the past while, and gotten to know his, his brand of humour, who he is as a person quite well. But I will point out that, that I bought this copy in fact, not once but twice, I bought the Kindle version and then I bought the physical copy, reading half in one and half in the other. But if that negates whether I can give an honest review, that's up to yourself. But, harder in cash. Anyway, what is The Trials of Ashmount? Well, it's a grimdark novel set in a world called Sedain. I think the series is going to be called The Tragedy of Sedain. So I think you get the idea that... You know, bad things are about to happen in this world. And we get told the story from five different point of views, mainly. There are some interludes. And five characters with which to explore the world through. Typical young boy, Kelvin, who dreams of a better life. And in, and in doing so, dreams of making a pilgrimage to a place called, well, Ice Mount. And Ice Mount is a place where you can train to become a magic user if you're found to have the talent to be able to use it. Sort of that academy trope. We have Serdal, who's a young one concerned with everybody around her, but especially her father, as she tries to flee from basically a massacre at the start of the book. The dastardly people involved trying to seek and find a place of refuge for herself and her family that will keep them safe. You've got Village, who's like a, a travelling warrior of some sort, who is part of a tribe or a series of tribes who seem to be moving through the land and, and are in a constant state of battle and constantly fighting. Very interestingly, a character called Demry, Demry Slarn, and he's a criminal, and he's sort of hell-bent on exacting revenge for past ills in his life, and he's going through committing poor, bad, murderous deed after murderous deed in order to get redemption for, for this for those past crimes. And then you have my favourite, who's Edelbrock. And Edelbrock's a guy who's trying to up his station in life, trying to create a better life for him and his family, his wife and his kid, prepared to do it by any nefarious means or ways that he has open to him. So you get the idea that we have sort of some very typical fantasy characters and some those kind of morally grey, the people that are imperfect the whole way through it. The story itself kind of sets these characters in front of the world and tells the tapestry of the world through their five points of view. You're not really given an idea at the start of kind of where they link up yet, you know, in terms of location or how the world works. And, and I thought actually at the start, before I settled into the rhythm of the book, that I thought maybe we would just get continuously different points of view about the world so that we got a flavour for the world because, you know, I think that's an interesting way to do it. Now, ultimately, it isn't what happened, but it's also sort of how the start of the book felt insofar as you were getting all these like snippets and snapshots of how different parts of like noble life, village life, nomadic life, all the different types of life that, that there were throughout the world and kind of getting a different look from, from each point of view. For a genre not known for its like inventiveness and risk taking and that there are certain archetypes that become the expect in these stories, John really plays with an awful lot of this. This is very much a character based tale. You know, you have these five POVs and the character arcs kind of mould and change as we have the character flaws the situations they find themselves in, the challenges that they've got to overcome, and the kind of, like, their honourable people who that they already are, all mixed into one. And the characters and what you appear to think is going to happen morph along with these changes in the characters, and it's really, really clever. Especially by the time we get to the end, when what I thought the story was going to be, or who I thought each of the people were at the start, has morphed completely to the end. One of the big sort of like selling points I suppose of the book straight up is, is the magic system and while it's like clearly defined and clearly designed at the start it also is the part of the book that, that has still contains most of the mystery with the world. So like magic users of all types whether they're the the power wielders, the people who cast destructive spells or otherwise, the people that create the power for them to do that through the use of a rune system which they draw on on the parts of the body and activate those runes or you know healers etc they all use magic at a cost and what i mean by cost well basically they exchange the ability to use magic in exchange for time some days months years of their life they give up in the idea that they will use it and wield it as power you know, the more powerful the spell the more years and days and months that it will take off your life so it's a balance 
between one and the other. And it's a really interesting idea, and it's sort of similar to some of the ideas that are in like The War Eternal by Rob J. Hayes, except he uses sources, etc. as, as his vehicle for to do it, and that, that isn't that isn't uh, strictly what's happening happening here. There's another magic system that's woven into the story, and the exploration of that is much less developed, and in fact creates some real fantastic character and story developments within it and to say much more about it i think would spoil on to my favorite bit which are kind of like the themes well you have these ideas as i've said before of like gray characters characters that see themselves as either good or evil or sometimes good people doing bad things i think one of the themes is that, that we really don't know who we are until we're in certain situations and in certain ways are we just hopeful for for a better future, or are will we willing to mould events to our to our way in order to achieve our outcomes? It's a well trodden path, I'd say, for the, for this genre, for sure. But it's definitely done slightly differently here than than, than many other grim dark books, where good characters are good, bad characters are bad, etc. Everybody's somewhere in the middle, which leads on to the idea of hope. I know from talking to a lot of people, some people say grim dark doesn't have hope, whereas some people say, well, there has to be hope in a grim dark for there to be a way out of it so it doesn't feel too oppressive and this this book is very much about characters who are hoping everybody must have a hope and a dream of where to go and, and what way they want their life to be shaped and end up some started the very start of the book where they're trying to rebuild and have the hope some people are, it happens halfway through the book some people at the end all the hopes come and the dreams making and the, the shifting of the sands in, in their life kind of change who they are and what they they hope to do you also have a theme and a bit of an exploration of like religion and atheism like village the character village is a very says a warrior but he's uh he's part of a culture of tribes that very much believe in the god and the destiny of the gods and he's contrasted very much face to face with the character who doesn't believe in any of that kind of th is a realist or a bit of an atheist and What's really fascinating about it, I thought for a while it was going to really go into judging these different different aspects of life, but it just kind of pairs them off side by side to each other and kind of lets you make your own mind up about what is happening or whether there's, you know, there's value in religion or whether, you know, it leads people to make right and wrong decisions. I think it's really different to kind of explore something like that, especially within the setting of a book. So, like, Back to this grimdark idea, some people have said, you know, is it grimdark? And I suppose it depends on what your definition of grimdark is. Are there morally grey characters? Absolutely, certainly. In fact, pretty much all of them are morally grey in, in some way, shape or form. Are there some horrific and unexpected events? Definitely, that is, that is a thing that happens in here. Are there scenes that some might find upsetting? Yes. It has an overall grim tone, aside from the point of view that's following a criminal, that's almost sort of very grim at that age, it feels like a very strong and traditional fantasy narrative, and I think that's due to a num number of points. I mean, you have the magic system, which is very kind of epic fantasy in, in terms of, of magic system, very well designed, like a lot of epic fantasy systems, and it also has that academy trope in it as well. So there's a couple of things about the story and how it's designed that sort of are not typical, I would say, of, of, of some other grimdark books that I've read. Not that I'm very well versed in the entire genre, to be perfectly honest, but it definitely has a feel of a fantasy series with some, you know, dire and darkly comic events that happen in it. I mean, humour plays a big part in this book and if this is one of these things where getting to know John over the past while and understand this humour I can see it on the page it's very much John Palladino on a page when you read it I can see his, his type of humour his type of jokes and his personality all over the page and I think that's one of the things that I've found quite a lot over the past years that when I've gotten to know you know authors before I've read the book or after they've read the book you kind of can reverse engineer and see that person on the page with it which i think is is something that i personally really like to see i find myself laughing at maybe other bits that people would have been deeply upset by or otherwise maybe because i understand where the humor is coming from and i sort of wanted every point of view in the book to be darkly comic but because it's very much told from from a first person point of view you get some chapters that are very darkly comic and then others that aren't and 
I certainly at the start of the book, one of the, the downsides that I had of getting into it was the fact that the comedy would be like turned on and off. And I struggled with that a bit at the start because I kind of wanted it to be darkly comic all the time. But I think it would have been, would have lost its effectiveness as it goes through the book if that had been the case. But I definitely relish the, the comic a- aspects of this, even bits that you're not really supposed to laugh at. Uh, the other things that I didn't find particularly great was, like I said, getting into the to the book was sort of not easy in terms of connecting with the characters. For a character-based story to kind of fling around between the five different POVs at the start and kind of come back around, not all of them was quite gripping initially. Some of them were, some of them, some of them weren't, but the, the story develops and it maybe took to about halfway through the book before I kind of really had a strong sense of who everybody was, who the people around them were, kind of where they were in the world. Again, some people may find that challenging, it was kind of when I was going back through and reading through the book and the notes that I made. You know, I always leave it a couple of weeks before I do a review. I kind of reveled in going back through the book, and the characters, and some of the events that happened within here. I think a word to say of something that I really do like on 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 the printed copy here. If you read printed copy, one of the problems I have with printed copies sometimes is that the print. Printing kind of goes a bit too far into the middle and makes it difficult to read. There, But there's a nice margin in the middle so that I don't really have to super break the spine in order to get into the middle of the book. Made it a very enjoyable read. It probably increased the page count a bit in this book. I made it kind of look a bit bigger than what it reads, but I very much appreciated the reading experience. And if the reading experience continues in that way, I'm, I'd be very very happy. So all in all, I think Trials of Eichmann is is a really great story. I found that I actually delighted to make my way through it. And with book two coming very soon, Buzzard Bowl, I can't wait to dive back into the world. If you like darkly comic, grim dark stories with kind of characters who make great progression throughout the story and who mould and change to the world around it, then this might just be the book for you. If you've read the book and want to hear more about it or see some of the discussions and themes discussed, I will put a link at the end of the video to the discussion that we had with um, the author John Paladino himself, where I get to probe him and others get to probe him about what we thought about about the book and uh, what we liked and what we wanted answers or what John could or could not tell us. If you've made it this far in the video, thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you next time on the channel. Take care.